Good morning, everybody. Yes, we are live. It is Thursday morning, cliffcentral.com. It's just after six o'clock. Bitcoin is racing to 47,000 odd rand, uh, sorry, odd dollars a Bitcoin. Um, everywhere else, the stock markets are crazy. It's up and down. Politics is all over the place. We've still got that lunatic uh, Joe Biden in the White House. We've still got another lunatic Boris Johnson in 10 Downing Street. We've got Cyril Ramaphosa, who people have come up with some pretty creative names for here in South Africa. The world's the same as it was yesterday. Don't panic. <laughs> and here she is, Pumi Mashiko. Good morning, Pums. Good morning. Yes, good morning. And welcome home. Like How are you? I haven't seen you in ages. I was expecting you to be a little bit like tag. What's up with that? I was expecting like Mexico I, to have. I thought I was a bit tan. <laughs> is it that, is, am I so white that I'm not even a little bit tan? Look at me. <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> really? I was. I, I got. I mean, I got burnt in the sun. That's for sure. I really did. Oh, hey. how yeah. was it? So I know um, everybody else has probably heard the story, but I have not. Did you love it? It was phenomenal. It was um, it was a really cool trip. And listen, Mexico is far away. Hey? So if you if you're planning on just if you just want to do a holiday, I would not suggest that Mexico is your best bet because you have to take quite a number of flights to get there. And it's it's far, but it's lovely. Um, it's very very interesting. It's a it's a tremendously diverse country in terms of. And I only saw a little bit of it. Obviously, I didn't go to Mexico City, which is apparently amazing. I didn't go to the west coast of Mexico, which is also amazing for different reasons. So I only really saw like the Yucatan Peninsula. Cancun is this amazing resort town with just hundreds of hotels. I mean, you know, when you think about like a resort place, what do, what do you think of usually? If I say resort town, do you think of what, like Miami? Langabon. <laughs> no, no, no. So this place has got like, a thousand or more bedroom hotels all along a strip, which it takes you 10 minutes to drive along that strip. And there's not a gap where there is no hotel. Sure. So Cancun is, it's just, and it's obviously where a whole lot of Americans go on holiday every year because the weather is unbelievable. It was sunny every single day. Mm. But While you were away, you, we had lots of rain. Just I believe so. so. No, I know. Thanks rain, for that. It rained almost every day. Well, apart from that, we haven't really had a summer, so I'm still annoyed about all of that, and summer's definitely over. I actually needed a blanket on my bed for the last for the first time yesterday. Um, I went to went to sleep, and I woke up in the middle of the night. I was cold. I was like, what is going on here? I miss you. I never came. We are about to have a very long winter. We are about to have a very long winter, and I think a very cold one. Oh, don't say that. I don't need it. I really don't. I'm not a winter person, none in the least. So we've got quite a lot to talk about this morning, Pums. Um, we've also got the burning platform as usual. So much stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in the news. Um, but luckily for all of us, it is a, a Thursday, which gives us the excuse to talk about the stuff that we try to avoid the rest of the week. And, you know, I said on Tuesday... I do want to kind of change the direction of the show so we don't end up being that show that just moans and complains and gets miserable and says horrible things and does nasty stuff. And because you know, it's kind we of everyone. We have not been complaining. Uh, we, we uh, listen on the burning platform, we do spend a fair amount of time saying how unimpressed we are with Cyril, etc. No, but we also we talk about a lot of stuff. We had, we had a fantastic guest while you were away. From Japan, I heard. The, day after, the day after the earthquake. I heard because um, I actually got messages on the screen from people who were listening and just loved him. <laughs> was, that wasn't a complaint. It, it, uh -oh. gave, it gave us a chance to, to complain about another country for a <laughs> But one of the things he did say was um, Peter Stradon. And one of the things he did say was South Africans are particularly good. It's complaining. I agree. Oh, we, we are. We really we are. We would you win know, the Olympics. We would win the Olympics. If there was a category for complaining, it would be between us and the British every year. <laughs> every well, single year. You know, Maybe they so, brought that 
they you asked about that here with their colonialism. Maybe, maybe that's where it comes from because they have a very strong streak for complaining. I mean, the, the Brits will complain about pretty much everything, but ask them to be happy and they do it in very kind of um, understated. No, uh, we, very measured. We don't do it in understated. When we're happy, we're, we're all properly the way out there. So you mentioned Mexico, and it's worth also reflecting that all of these countries have problems. I mean, I was in the U.S. briefly because we flew in and out via, via Miami, which is, you know, I've never been to Miami before, and I really only saw the airport. So it's unfair of me to, to generalize about the whole place. But, you know, the airports are run by the, the federal government, and it's just, it's just awful. Like, just queues. Americans love a queue, hey, Pumi. I don't know. <laughs> We're gonna, if we're going to generalize about nations, Americans love a queue. If, and, and I mean, Russians had to learn to queue because they, that's the only way they could get their bread and their basic supplies. But Americans actually love it. You know when a new Apple iPhone comes out or if there's a new ride at the, at the fairground, Americans will queue up from the night before. They just love it. Mm. And, I, I have and, never seen so the two airports with crazy queues for me was mm -hmm. um, Abu Dhabi du Dubai uh, wasn't that bad Abu Dhabi was really really bad there were queues and queues and queues and um, JFK lots right. of queues yeah 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 always Rome Miami's was unbelievable there were no queues in Rome there were no queues in Vienna. In fact, I didn't even know that I'd gone through the terminal. <laughs> I, I didn't even realize that I had actually gone through the terminal. By the time I picked up my bags, walked around, the next thing I saw was a spa in the door to where you catch the bus. Uh huh. Right. <laughs> right. This is amazing. That's österreichische um, uh, efficiency. Um, but Mexico. Outside of the resorts and, and, the, and the tourist areas of Cancun, you drive, and I mean, I spent, again, very little time there, so I'm not an expert, but it really does look a lot like a rundown neighborhood in central Johannesburg. You know, the, the, the buildings are all, some of them aren't finished properly. It's, it's a lot like, um, you know, you know, you'll sometimes drive past uh, or through a township and you'll see that there are some unfinished buildings. Like someone yes. obviously started to, building the house. Right. And they wanted to go double story, but then the bottom people are living in, but there's nothing at the top. The window's in there and there's everything, but no one lives there. And it's got no roof and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's a bit like that. And people still live. And this was, this was to some, uh, when, I, when I told the story, it, it really shocked some people. Most people in rural Yucatan, where I was, driving, you know, to kind of the pyramids of Chichen Itza or whatever. They live in grass and wood huts. They, they live in huts with banana leaf roofs and, and grass roofs. And it's not unlike going through, you know, the trans guy, to be perfectly honest. Um, wow. it's, it's quite something. So you think, when you think of Mexico, you think, you know, um, this huge Tequila. big mix. Well, you think tequila, you think... Uh, people with sombreros on. You think um, you think of tourist parts of Mexico if, if you've ever kind Cactus. of seen the, the brochures. Yeah, but and obviously you think of drug cartels. But the fact is, like Mexico's got a lot in common with South Africa. There's this first world Mexico, which is really really impressive and beautiful and magnificent, and people spend lots of money going there every year for holidays. And then there's rural, real Mexico, which is a lot like third world South Africa. Um, so much so that, you know, the government doesn't really work in some places. There was endless road construction going on. Endless. I mean, every major arterial road I was on, there was construction along. And big time construction, you know, like building bridges, retarring, dust everywhere, graders and front end loaders, that kind of thing. So it's wow. interesting because... When you, come to, when you come to South Africa after being on a trip like that, you do see things that when you left, you didn't notice. Oh, wow. And I, I, again, it makes me pleased. I know a lot of people have many problems, and we're right to have many problems with our, our government, the way that the country's run, the way that we've got this, this 
lackluster economy and huge. I saw yesterday, again, they published the unemployment figures and they are frightening. They're the highest unemployment figures we've ever had as a country. Now, there's no way you can hide your head in the sand about stuff like that. But I still, when I come home, I'm always happy to be home. And I know that this is the place in the world that I want to be the most. So, you know, shoot, shoot me if you like, but that's what I think. And are the people, because you're a pretty tall guy, are the people super short? No, not really. Um, we had a tour guide around uh, Chichen Itza who was as tall as me, maybe, maybe a little bit taller, a guy called wow. Alberto. And he was so knowledgeable and brilliant that um, I, I hardly noticed. And then when we, when we were all walking somewhere, I suddenly thought, oh, this guy's very tall. But, I mean, I wouldn't say by and large their, their population is shorter or taller than the average South African. Um, you well, know, a, lot of, a lot of people in Africa will say that South Africans are the shortest on the continent. We are. Um, <laughs> no, we are. But um, a couple of years ago, Muzi, who's going to be on later, went yes, to exactly. Mexico City for business. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he had to say when he got back is, my goodness, the people are short. Because he's also... <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Muzi's worth six foot four as well, so he's no, he's no slouch. <laughs> that was his, his biggest thing, was, goodness, everywhere I went, the people were just so small. <laughs> but this thing, this thing about queues, it's, it's quite a weird... I mean, there is a mentality to queues. Look, some of them you can't avoid, right? You have to, when you're, when you're in immigration queues or in customs queues, you just have to stand there and go through it, right? But I am the kind of person, if I see a queue, I turn the other way. Uh, but there are some people who, when they see a queue, they can't wait to join it because they think they're going to miss out on something if they don't. <laughs> I'm not that person. What no. the hell? No, Be but honest. you see it. Haven't you seen it outside shops or... You know, even when a new movie comes out or something like people do. They, some people like it. Yeah. Drives Not me crazy. Me. Yeah. Drives me crazy. We have enough places here that have... And there are people who have actually started businesses to stand in the queue for you. I know. But, um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know how well those work. <laughs> I haven't used them yet. But, uh, but I if, have. If, again, listen, if there's a gap in the market, someone's going <laughs> to fill it. And there's something about that too, which... Again, and I'll talk to Muzi about this with you when we do the burning platform later on. But when you've traveled a little bit, you do start to see things that are actually major opportunities in your home country that you would, you would have thought of as being disadvantages before. And, and this is, again, going to sound very controversial. But if you think that a rule-based society, which we are not, I mean, nobody really listens to rules in this country. People, you just see it on the roads, you know. We're by and large, we're certainly more law abiding than places like Nigeria or Bangladesh. But there's something about living in a country where people aren't absolute sticklers about the rules. Like you saw during COVID, you know, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, those sorts of countries were like, we're going to follow the rules, we're going to do this. And everybody just did exactly what the government told them. In this country, we don't do that. And, and the reason I think that that's a plus rather than a minus because the minuses are obvious, right? Things don't work yeah. as well. Things aren't on time. Um, people don't know where they stand. The, the rich get away with stuff. Politically connected people don't have to follow the rules, et cetera, et cetera. We know the disadvantages. We deal with them every week on the burning platform. But the advantages are that where there are gaps in the system, like you couldn't get someone to queue for you in Canada. You couldn't, you couldn't, <laughs> find, a, you know, you couldn't find a person who, if you're in a hurry can push you to the front of the queue or can make a plan for you. You know, in South Africa, everything's negotiable, which, which creates entrepreneurship and, mm. and opportunity. And let's not pretend that's not a part of what we, we have in this country and what, what we kind of, I think, I love. I love it. It's a bit that's like the Wild West. You know, you can, you can get up and wake up in the morning. It's a frontier country. Right. You can do what you want here and you can make it possible for other people to do what they want. I don't know that that's so possible in those very rule-based societies. Probably not. Probably not. But I, I do I do feel like it, if we had more adherence to some things, hmm. it would make, uh, like no, you I, said, like on the roads, my I, worst thing 
is well, and people are people are nice people are, are predominantly nice in south africa and people like mm. to be polite but what what polite is to one person or nice is to one person is not necessarily the same to the next person Correct. so that causes chaos and confusion yeah. and that's where rules kind of they make everything better everybody well, couple, knows what is here are a couple of comments on cues um First of all, uh, Sanele wants to compliment you on your hairstyle. Because, oh, thank uh, you, thank you, thank you. Very nice. Uh, Jamie says, lines are for losers. And Jamie is <laughs> um, And then Slice19 says, Americans don't love cues, they love lines. Some don't have a, cue, a clue what a cue is, <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> they Lindy, certainly won't, it won't spell it. Lindy says, I can't even cue at a drive through Yeah, I don't like that either. If I see there's too many people, I, I'm, I'm out. I'm like you, Pumi. Um, cues for the toilet is the pits. <gasps> yeah, that's especially no, for girls. They, they never really cues. They never cues for the guys' bathroom because if guys need to pee, they just go outside. Don't don't in a, a toilet with a queue. Don't don't stand in the queue because then you know that those toilets are already going to be a mess. Ugh, just, but what, what if you have no option? Hold Where? it in. Hold <laughs> it in and go home. Hold <laughs> it in and go home. It's time to go home. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Uh, the worst, says Carl, is queuing for food, like at a buffet. I feel like it's to meet me. I won't do it. I'll wait for everyone to be done, and if there's nothing left, then so be it. Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing with the buffet is you need to be at the front, or you mustn't go at all. Because if you're not at the front, by the time you've got there, people have, you know, they've they've dropped their, yeah. their flaky uh, their skin in there. No. They, They've been talking to their friends and spitting into the food. It's just disgusting. A buffet is the worst thing. And you have to be at the front. My, my, I had an aunt who said once, she said, darling, it's a buffet. You must sh make sure you get to the front or someone else will drop their pubic ah, into it. And I thought, yeah, that's about right. And that is how she, that is how she's found. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Look at this. Pissing. There's a guy. There's a, there's a guy renting chairs at the Acacia Home Affairs. Like, see? see, you see, that's cool. You can rent a chair at the Acacia Home Offices for a fee. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh. <laughs> uh, Patrick has a problem with bank queues. The worst. I'd rather go bankrupt. Lol. What yeah. are you doing inside a bank? I haven't been to a bank. When last did you go to a bank? The last time I did was to get my new passport. Because, you know, uh, some yeah. of the banks, they do this thing with uh, home affairs. So I reckon, well, better to queue in a bank than to queue in home affairs. And it was very quick. But that's the last time I was in a bank. And before that, I can't even tell you. I, I, I don't know. They even send the card to you now. You don't even have to go. For, I opened a new bank account on the phone. Hmm. Within two weeks, I had the card delivered to my mm -hmm. office. I, I, I don't know. What are you doing right. in a bank? I'd love to know what he was doing in the bank. The worst cues, says Luzanne, are where you have no choice, like home affairs or the traffic department. Yeah, I think that's about right. Um, I should go and rent out umbrellas at that home affairs office, says Robert, because that is true. It's always in the, it's always in the hot sun or in the rain, you know, uh, for people who are standing in those cues. It's terrible. Um, and then Roberts also said he saw the chair rental in Vereniging as well. So it's happening all wow. over the place. People, wow. people see a gap and they take it. This is very good. All right. For me, we have to do this just because everyone else has had a say about this. Have you got any nuanced point of view on Will Smith and Chris Rock? Or do you just want to breeze past it? Do you not care? <laughs> I've got to give you the option. It's hard not to care. There's yeah. so many things going on there. There have been so many think pieces. I think in the past few yes. days, I've seen more think pieces about that thing. But a friend of mine said something that I thought, wow, that could have been something. He said, she thinks that if Will Smith had walked up to Chris and whispered a threat mm. and walked away, it might have been more effective. Yeah. I think, I, I was like, we, we, would, we would all be wondering, like, Whoa, what, what happened there? <laughs> And that would have been such a display of power because then he could have, he could have received his, his Oscar afterwards and said, um, I'm not going to tell anybody what I said to Chris. So, you know, 
but don't talk about my life. <laughs> then, then people would have gone, wow, this guy's like, you know, that's, that would be like a Vladimir Putin Bond villain move. Right. As opposed to, eh, this little w- w- wussy slap. It, it was hectic, though. I, I don't know if I told you this. I, I in December, read his um, biography. Mm-hmm. That, that mm. that's you did been, say so. It and having read that, and then watched what happened, it kind of it it connected for me. I was like, yeah, this guy's he's going through a lot. He's going through stuff. I don't know. I don't know if this is what a midlife crisis is. The stuff that's Ooh, happening to him. That's an interesting take. Because he, he is like, there, there's a lot. There's a lot happening. I mean, in the in the biography, he talks about his dad who was extremely violent to his mom, mm-hmm. um, and and being a child and watching that and not knowing how to react. He talks about the relationship with Jada and how, mm-hmm. you know, at, at, and the point at which she called him out for kind of not caring and how hard he was working and you know. And it, it was just so when I saw and and his kind of his ayahuasca journeys is oh, like right. deep diving in the, the, the like all of those things. So when I saw that moment, I kind of went, yeah, that guy's going through a lot, you know. And this perfectly I, I, curated personality <clears throat> that he's had for his yeah. entire career, because his personality and his appearances and everything was all very calculated, all very... Yeah. He's always been one of those uh, people who you thought, wow, this guy is, you know, he's got his shit together. And you, you, are, you are the fourth person to tell me you've read his, his autobiography, which is very interesting, because I think a lot of people who've read that would have a much more, um, a much more thoughtful take on, on the whole Oscars thing. What I'm interested in as an outside observer because i've never really been you know i've never been a huge will will smith acolyte but i've always liked him he's always been to me that very likable guy in hollywood that kind of dude who toes the line he works really hard you can see that he's an absolute work machine and and he 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 created that he and his manager a friend of his and he talks about it in the in the book how they figured out Essentially, how they figured out the equation of what he needed to do to mm. bring in the most amount of money for the films that he does, where right. he needed to show up, how he needed to do your junkets. It was all calculated and all curated. Right. And so when I saw that, I, I just, it, for and me, he, it was he, a continuation of the man is going through so, stuff. So I follow him on, on social media. Well, uh, on Instagram. On Instagram. Uh, and he's and he's fun to follow because he, he's all about like self mastery and adventure and having fun. And you know, he seems to me to be, well seemed to be one of these people who's got his shit together. And then when that happened, I'm like, well, clearly you don't have your shit together because you could have handled this in, in twenty three different ways. And I said this the other day, and some people agreed and some people didn't. But I don't think it showed him off in the best possible way. Like again, uh there are there are plenty of ways he could have handled that as a man standing up for his woman, which I believe is you know, sorely missing in this world too much of the time. There aren't enough men who are willing to take a risk or stand up for their woman. And I think that's an admirable quality in a man. But I also don't think that you should embarrass yourself publicly at the world's most prestigious awards ceremony where you've been working your backside off for years to win that Oscar and almost like slip on the banana peel just before you collect your award. It's like such a self-sabotage. And maybe you hit the nail on the head just now. This is an interesting approach that I haven't heard before. And it could only come from someone who's read the whole book. But it's maybe a midlife crisis of a kind. And look, Jada and he don't have a conventional relationship. And they put it all out there, right? I mean, the two of them, that's a very dangerous road to go down. The minute you start sharing everything with the public, the minute you start sharing your wife with other men, it's bound to get it's bound to get messy and you can't then be the guy who steps in when your own wife makes you a cuckold in front of the whole world, which is essentially what happens. As far as we can tell, they have this open relationship, but we see her with other men very publicly and we don't see him with other women. So it's not a balanced 
situation. I mean, I've, I've got, I've got a friend who's tried this open relationship stuff. It never oh, works. Really? Yeah, it never works. Um, well, I've got the, both the guy and the girl in this situation. Uh, they tried it for a while and they were together maybe a year or two and it's, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work because the minute they, you know, there are always, there's going to be an imbalance of feelings and you can never, ever be sure that you're going to be exactly at 50, 50. Um, and the moment that that imbalance occurs, then jealousy sets in or, or resentment. And I don't believe, I mean, this would be something to talk to, to Dr. Hanan about, or, or even to anyone who's been in these kinds of situations. I don't believe it's possible to keep. I would oh. love You're to have this part. conversation. The mm. one person I would have loved to have this conversation with more than any other person in the whole world is Makumal. <laughs> she doesn't talk to anyone, have you noticed? I know. <laughs> I yeah. know. I would love to hear. I mean, you know, there's there's a reality show with the Inselebu and his... I don't mm. know, five wives or whatever. I, yes. I haven't seen it. I haven't <laughs> seen it. I haven't, I just, I, I don't know. I just find it too vacuous. But I would love to have a conversation with somebody in a polygamous marriage for a long time or somebody in an open relationship. I, I just, it so well, fascinates all the, me. Or those Mormons, you know, those, those Mormons, have, <laughs> they call, call each other sister wives. You know, <laughs> big love <laughs> that I would love. So you should yeah, invite I, your I, friends. Listen, I'll tell you something. Well, they won't come on. They're, they're not together anymore. And they, it um, doesn't matter. They can come no, on about would, their experience. They wouldn't. They wouldn't okay, can you just have a dinner? Can you have a dinner and invite me? And you? just record it. <laughs> no, no. Just invite me. Just invite me to the dinner, right. sir. <laughs> maybe, maybe they'd do that, but I don't think they would sit around a table together now. Uh, it's Yo. complicated. It, it's very, it's very hard to, because um, humans think we can do these things, but we, 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 very few humans get it right, which means that it's probably not our natural inclination. Mm. I think monogamy is just easier because you hold each other to a standard that you decide between you. Sometimes it's a little bit more flimsy. Sometimes it's very rigid. Neither of those necessarily result in in the best outcome, but I think there are people in the middle who manage to have a slightly kind of personalized approach that, that find their way to do it. I, d I don't know. Again, I'm not speaking from personal experience, but just from observation. Um, there's quite a lot we, we wanted to cover this morning. I, I do want to get to headlines in a second, but uh, there are lots of interesting comments about all this uh, stuff. And since it's the biggest topic, you know, I, I know some people are sick of this thing, but it is. This Will Smith thing has brought up a whole lot of other interesting discussions, and therefore, it's not something we're going to avoid. Did you see that Will, uh, that Bruce Willis is retiring because he's developing dementia? No. Yeah, yeah he's got like, uh, it's called, um, Afro, uh, it's, it's got a different name. It's not dementia, but he's basically having trouble communicating. It gets fuzzy around words and, and, and writing and speech. So, aphasia. Wow. I think it is aphasia wow. he's yeah he's been diagnosed with that so he's going to be retiring and and kind of coming off the screen and and that's that's sad i mean listen that nobody is. lasts nobody lasts forever right and you can watch a, an actual human being deteriorate in real time if you just switch on any joe biden press conference because <laughs> it's not great it's really not great the other day he actually <laughs> he suggested in a bald-faced way, that regime change and chemical weapons were realities on the cards for him. I mean, you don't do that if you're totally with it. He, I know. He came back and apologized two days later. I was just well, like... you imagine the White House scrambling because that's all Vladimir Putin needs to say, ah, you see, I told you so. They're just trying to remove me. Yeah, like you're, they, giving, you're giving a gift to the enemy. It's what America does all the time, push for regime change around the world, but they Correct. never say it out loud. No, not, not that idiot. He can't wait to say something stupid. Um, you know, we spoke with Bhagavan the other day. We spoke about um, the Godfather. Mm. But the fact that Al Pacino is 81, still doing interviews. So funniest part of the interview I read with him in the New York Times mm. was, was him saying when people call him, 
and they say, are you alone? He says, I'm never alone. I'm just hanging out here with my ego. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. Oh, he's great. Now you see, that, that, but there's a good 80 and there's a bad 80. I mean, I, I was at this wedding and there's a couple who are 90 and 88 years old. And Pumi, you can't believe how sharp these people are. They are sharp. They are on the ball. They've got all their ideas are still firmly in their heads and they're willing to share them. They, they move faster than many 80 and 90 year olds. <laughs> they, they are not afraid of, uh, of, of getting involved. You know, and I, I just think sometimes it's the luck of the draw. Sometimes it's just your genes. Some mm. people have really good it genes is. and get to, get to 90 and look and feel and sound and appear amazing. Others yeah, do not. That is true. That is yeah. true. My mom just turned 65 and she's learning how to swim. Wow, your mom's 65, huh? This is her new thing, is learning how to swim. My mom's never amazing. known how to swim. That's beautiful. <laughs> Well, I went to I went to a ceremony yesterday at the French ambassador's house uh, where Carolyn Stain, who you may know from oh, yes. Seven Blankets, Carolyn Stain was awarded the uh, Ordre pour le Mérite, which is like the highest civilian honor that the French government bestow for all of her work on 67 Blankets and with oh. the French Institute. And, you know, she's been working quietly behind the scenes with the French Institute, helping people to study French, uh, helping people to, to learn about French music and culture. And this is all part of what she does. And so she received this, uh, this honor yesterday, which was really special. That's and, yeah, it's nice to see foreign governments also awarding South Africans because our government do these ceremonies, which I don't know if anybody's watching them much anymore, but we should, because ordinary civilians are doing things that are actually really important. Art, culture, society development of you know charity work that kind of thing and and it's nice to see governments doing this that's really one of their most important roles is to keep uh, morale up in the citizenry by awarding people who are doing good shit you know it's nice to see so again congrats to carolyn and um and a, a very very happy day in the sun for lots of people at the in pretoria is just i gotta say it again it's just such a great city and and this this French ambassador's house is so perfectly located. It's got these beautiful views and these big lawns. And I mean, you can imagine magnificent. Sure. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's turn our attention to the serious stuff for just a second. And some of it's more serious than the rest. But um, you know that girl, Sibongi Limani, uh, she has been charged or sentenced rather no, to sentence. five years in prison for stealing those NISFAS funds. Remember, she took 818 thousand rand out after 14 million was accidentally transferred into her account and that this happens sometimes it happens in small or big amounts but she thought oh bonus and went and spent 818 thousand rand of not her money and she's been sentenced to five years in prison by you know by the prosecutors and by the judge so this is this is obviously you know you, you've got to feel a little bit sorry for her because there's an <laughs> element of stupidity and ignorance that while it gets you into trouble is not always doesn't it always seem fair like five years in jail um and and you think about would you have done it would you not have done it you could be very hardline about this but there's a young lady who's not going the, to jail it's not nice i think the thing that is most galling for everyone watching this and whether you think she was right or wrong mm -hmm. is the fact that she is sentenced and going to jail. Right. And Zuelim Kize is trying to become the president of the country. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, like, and, and all those people who stole like close to a trillion rand from our economy are still at large, right? That, that's the thing. That's the thing that is, that, that just makes, that makes me sick. That's the thing that makes me so sick about this. It's, right or wrong, whatever happened to her, it is just. I think you can say that you can say with absolute confidence that South Africa is one of the countries in the world where the smaller your crime, the the more you will pay. Uh, the larger your crime, the likelier it is you'll get away. And that rhymes, so I'm happy if you use it from now on. Put it on a, put it on a poster. <laughs> put it on a cup. Yeah. 
and the cost. The smaller your crime, the more you will pay. The bigger your crime, the more likely you'll get away. That's how it goes. That's South Africa. And it, it, it does seem unfair to me. This, this poor little girl. I mean, she is a little girl. She's a student, you know. And she, she stupidly spent money on clothes and all kinds of crap that she didn't need. You know, she went to, she spent 174,000 rand at Checkers Hypermarket and Centurion. She spent 107,000 at Checkers Nonesi Mall in Kormani. So she was buying groceries and stuff. You know, it's just sad. And she was probably a sharing. And, what, 170,000? Yeah. yeah. Wow. She spent 178,000 at the discount supermarket in Fleet Street in East London. But not all in one go, obviously. You know? mm. But still, this, what, what upsets me about this is this is not someone who is sophisticated like the crooks who are stealing at the top of the pyramid. Mm. This is someone who's, she was a student. She suddenly saw this money in her account. Of course, it's wrong. I'm not going to dispute any of that. But now, instead of being a student, she's a prisoner. And, and the, the lesson is learned, but um, it's not a fair one, as you just pointed out, Holmes. Uh, okay, then this. Here's another thing that is deeply upsetting. A South African water polo coach has been found guilty of child porn and grooming in Australia and is going to be deported back home. Now, why do they send this guy home instead of locking him up? They don't want to have to pay to keep him locked up. Ah, okay. Well... He's a former teacher and polo, water polo coach, said to be deported from Australia after being sentenced to two years imprisonment. Okay, so they have uh, decided to give him two years in prison for child abuse, possession of child porn, and grooming. His name is Dean Carl, sir. He was arrested in March last year and charged with possessing child exploitation material. He reportedly had more than 2,000 images of child exploitation material on two phones. He reportedly faced charges of grooming children and indecent treatment. He pleaded guilty to all the charges. He's 41 years old, and he appeared in court on Wednesday where he was handed this two-year sentence. After his release, they're going to send him to South Africa. So they are going to pay for two years of his imprisonment. <laughs> he took indecent recordings of children in their swimming costumes, and the court heard that he'd groomed a 13-year-old boy after taking the photos. This is a sickness, right? It, 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 it's, it's a sickness. There's, there's no... I can't get it into my head. Obviously, there's certain jobs that attract these people. And it seems to me like there is an, in, an incredible and disproportionate amount of water polo teaching going on in, in collaboration with child porn. It, see, it seems like that is a job. That and being a Catholic priest. That are just Sports. I think the, the I think it's in the sports arena. That, didn't we hear the same thing with the gymnastics team in the US? That's also true, yeah. That's right. I That's think exactly it's, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, Mkishang is asking, like, what is a, up with water sports and gymnastics coaches, though? I mean, this, this would make like there are probably some people who really want to coach gymnastics and water sports to kids, but now they're going to think twice and go, "Well, I don't know if I want to do that anymore because there's so many perverts in those jobs." Seems like those kinds of jobs attract them, though. It's horrible. Horrible. <laughs> Carl says, my son is two years old. He will play cricket or rugby and do public speaking, but not water polo. It's always the water polo <laughs> coaches. The chlorine makes them want to touch kids, and my kid is cute as fuck. <laughs> Carl, you're a sicko. Oh, man. Unacceptable. These pedos must be lost for life, says Rusty. People must wake up. Children are being exploited all over the world. Yep. Uh, ugh, it's horrible. Even girls mm. in water polo get felt up, says Robin. Mm. Yeah, athlete A on Netflix is a docky about the U.S. gymnastics mess. It's so worth a watch. Sure, sure. Mm. I don't know if I could watch oh, that. I, 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 I couldn't watch that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. oh. Upsets me too much. It's really, really horrible, and I don't even have kids. I find it so upsetting. Uh, next week's well, petrol hike. Have kids. That's what I I learned. I've been learning over the years is you you're so much more emotional about things that happen to kids it, it's just it's just like ramped up for you you know it just feels you see like Carl talks about his two-year-old I think in another four or five years he may feel very differently about that rugby or 10 years he may feel very differently about that rugby 
Yeah. Uh, so net, next week's uh, petrol price hikes may be smaller than previously feared. So this is maybe a good news story. You know, in, a, in, a, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed is king. According to the latest data from the Central Energy Fund, petrol and diesel prices currently look set for large increases on Wednesday next week, but not as big as previously expected. Based on the current data, 95 octane is set to increase by 1 rand 84 a litre. 93 is going up by 1 rand 76 a litre. Diesel by 2 rand 98 a litre. And you know they always have two prices because there's a coastal price and an inland price. Don't ask me why. 3 rand 14 a litre in inland. And illuminating paraffin by 2.5 rand uh, sorry, 2.51 2, 2 rand a litre. So it's all going up. Uh, it's just going up less than you expected. Are you excited? Have you stopped driving around? <laughs> well, I mean, those two weeks, uh, that, well, a week and a half that I was away in Mexico, I think I must have saved millions of rands <laughs> just by not driving. <laughs> Jeez. That's bad, man. Bad. I, I'm getting to the point, and I never, I never thought I'd get there, where um, where I'm actually thinking very hard about whether or not I need to go for this meeting, this dinner, this lunch. You know, before I would have said, sure, let's do it. Now, you're like half and half. Not always. I, I, I drove to Wendy's at San Marino. Oh, last yeah? Fr last Friday. Whew, that drive. Two and back, I was just like, yeah, man. <laughs> If anybody's going to get me to come out here again, it's going to have to be bloody worth it. Because it was like an hour and 20 minutes in the traffic getting there from my house and an hour at one in the morning to get back home. It's like, I was just like, never doing this you know, again. Um, there's no real advantage to petrol or diesel at the moment, is there? Because they, they're both no. really, really expensive, isn't it? You know, it's not as if everyone who's driving petrol cars can suddenly go and get a diesel car and they'll save some money. They're, they're commensurately extortionate. Mm. Certainly that's the way I do. I think it's more expensive since Vias and inland because the fuel has to be transported there. That's probably, that's probably the most obvious yes. reason. Makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Vias and I'm, I'm, I have no special knowledge of this stuff, but if that's what you say, it sounds sensible to me. Will she stay or will she go? Batabile Dlamini. <laughs> we love this woman, don't we? Uh, is it going to appear before the ANC's top six this week? What's your prediction, Pumi? I know what I think. What do you think? Oh, nothing. Nothing. She's not going to make it. No, she's not going to make it. You think they're going to can her? Yeah. Hmm. She's not going to make it. I, the... I heard an interview with Paul Mashadile. And, and he spoke about that, and he, he was very clear. This is what the rules are. I mean, look at, look at the ace. So no matter how much kicking and uh, screaming and noise ace is making, ace is outside. Right. Yeah, so, so you is, think she's going to go. Well, yeah, no, I mean, she, she already did the kicking and screaming and crying in the court because she said she's supporting all these people, but she's got like this unbelievably big salary that she gets every month it's like hundreds of thousands of rands that she gets paid as uh president of the women's league and uh on, on her pensions as a former minister so she's she's got lots of cash i don't know why she doesn't just go quietly spend her money more carefully and then she'll have a very nice life but she can get the hell off of the public payroll um well we're always going to be paying for it because of her pension but you know what i mean yeah i don't know i don't know I, so what's clear to me is that they don't know how to quit while they are ahead. Yeah. All of them. All of right. them. They don't know how to quit while they are ahead. No, they never know. But it's also it's this, this, this deep fear that eventually they are going to end up uh, poor that makes, makes a lot of these ministers steal. Um, you know, if you, if you sit down with them, it's this, it's this idea that this is their time to grab as much as they can because poverty is coming. Um, so if they, can, if they can assuage that and if they can mediate the poverty for a short while in between that's kind of the the justification that some of them give for why they take the way that they do um have you heard batabile speaking says carl that same two-year-old of mine avoiding water polo coach cock would do better <laughs> oh my god carl you're a disgusting human being carl carl, carl stop it 
Keenan. <laughs> Keenan says, Keenan says, my cousin is an ordained Catholic priest. I told him if he moves to a different area from far from Cape Town, that would confirm my suspicion of him touching kids. My family's in denial. Oh my God. Oh my God. So that, that is what the Vatican does, huh? They just move a priest as soon as there's any uh, untoward behavior, they just move them out of that diocese into another one. So there is a proven track record for the church in that respect. Another book I'm reading. <laughs> yes, you're reading a by lot of books. Pope. By the Pope. Eh, you know Which what? One? This, 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 current, this, this current Pope? This current Pope. Um, and it's called Let Us Dream. Mm. And, and he talks a lot about the church's history with, with kids, with moving priests, with unaccountability. And it's very refreshing to hear the person who's the head of this organization mm. talk about the reforms that me, and, and one of the things that, you know, <clears throat> there was a big conference, a synod that he talks about, where one of the things that was very much discussed was what, what needs to be done? What are, what are the better guardrails? that mm. need to be put in place. Because, you know, I, I mean, it is a church after all. And when people come and say this is what they want to do, you, they take it at face value that it right. is because, you, you know, because you are looking for a way to live out your faith and bring, help others. Bring, you know, so, and, and they don't have, it's not like a job interview. They don't have right. like psychometric testing and, and, no. and. And, you know, and a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of creeps creep in that way. <laughs> Just like the water polo coaches and the, no. you know, the, the, what are the guardrails that have to mm. be put in place? And, and how do you deal with it? But a fucking crazy story, um, which I, I still can't wrap my head around the fact that this is the kind of careerism that happens also in the church. Mm -hmm. is a story of a priest in South America who was planted, as it were. And it, it was all a lie. It was all a lie, but made up by another priest. And he was convicted and sent to prison, made up by another priest who just didn't want to be in competition with this one. In, I was just... Hey, whoa. we don't even know. You, you, you know if you've been in, even in a small office... Office politics are a big thing, right? People are always trying to outmaneuver each other, and especially in, in large companies where there, there are a lot of people and there's a lot at stake. But imagine, imagine in a church where it's such a closed circuit that your only chances of promotion are really trampling on other people and, and ruining their careers. It must be, to be in that world, is like high politics all the time. And just because they're walking around in, in clerical robes, doesn't mean that it isn't happening. I, mean, I think there's so many stories we don't even know about. The, the, the Vatican must be so filled with gossip and so busy all the time, just putting out fires. <laughs> he Ooh. talks about that as well. He talks about, but also he talks about how when he was in Germany, um, he did a PhD in Germany on some of the canonical writings, mm. that one of the things that he did is he read the history of the popes. So, like, it's, it's 10 volume. <laughs> and he says, after he read those uh, writings and those historical accounts, absolutely nothing that happens in Rome shocks him now. Nothing that happens in the Vatican shocks him because there's just... But the careerism is, is what's unbelievable for me, that priests yeah. would have the same level of ambition mm -hmm. to get ahead as oh, people in corporate. So can we just return from the, the sublime, if you'll put inverted commas around it, to the ridiculous? And Sanele asks a very interesting question here. If Batabile is canned, will she reveal all those small Anyana skeletons that she once threatened to unravel during the Zuma tenure? Do you remember? She was the one who came up with small Anyana skeletons. Do you remember? Ah, there are none. Or do you think there are? She's run out of uh, material. Listen here. There are skeletons but nobody is willing to put them out there. Ace Mahashule, that was his entire defense, was 
right. everybody's got everybody's got a scandal. Why am I the one being held to account? It's rubbish. But they'll never. Well, let's see what happens. If if you say that they'll can her, then that's at least a move in the right direction for the ANC. They, if they don't course correct at some point, uh, and, and maybe ACE is a course correction, maybe Batabile will be a course correction. They are few and far between these these moves in the right direction, but they're, they're on their way down anyway. They, they, There's this no is course correction. You think it's just necessity? Desperation. Wow, here's parallel parking throwing in some real gossip. More nuns have had abortions than they, they will ever acknowledge. That they will ever acknowledge. Priests use monasteries as whorehouses with the illegitimate kids buried out back. Now, that sounds like the kind of conspiracy stuff that was spread around in the Middle Ages. <laughs> but, but it may or may not be true. I don't know. Look, I'm, I'm not in favor of specifically uh, drawing the Catholic Church out of the might or the things that they do, except in the case of Peter Pidia, where they seem to have an outrageous record. Um, but, but all the other stuff, every religious institution throughout history has been full of uh, skullduggery, and careerism, and all kinds of other things. So I wouldn't say that they are particular uh, or particularly bad or evil or wicked in that respect. Where they are in my opinion is with the, the, the child sex. Anyway, <clears throat> so lots of other people commenting on um, Batile uh, and, and lots of other things to do with Catholic Church. I do want to move on to something else because we've got just a few minutes to get to the back home this morning. So we will be joined by Mr. Zaya. I mentioned the unemployment rate. So we could come up in our discussion later on. But we're heading towards 50% unemployment. And Kasatu have raised alarm bells over the record high unemployment rate, which is steadily creeping towards that 50%. Kisatu, of course, don't represent the unemployed. They represent employed people in unionized jobs, which is a much, much smaller percentage than the 50% of people that they're talking about here in Kisatu. They did say they're critical of government's failure to address non stack issues, which contributed to the country's job losses, including load shedding. And I think that's a very good point. How can you grow an economy where you aren't even sure that the electricity will be provided to those businesses that need it? To run, right, Holmes? Mm. So, a good and point being by uh, by Pakistan for a change. <laughs> and if, even more interesting point made by your president that the unions, you know, that and on the loom matter that they should be looking to grow. And I'm just like, yeah. how, how, how? You can't. Your potential for members is limited to the number of people that are employed. On the same day, we have new numbers about how much unemployment we have. Do you want these guys right. to grow? What like? People are complaining about my sound. Is this is this better? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Let me know if this is better. People are like, oh, can't hear you. Your audio is breaking up. Your sound is shit. So just let me know. <clears throat> I'm using the same desk we've been using for two years to do shows. We passed the two year mark. Yes, we are. On Sunday. Last week, Saturday. Saturday. There we go. Saturday. It's two years exactly since we went into lockdown. And here we are. I saw Mkosa Sanat Lamini Zuma put out this thing about how, oh, well, we're still going to have to do all the things that we're doing in the state of disaster, but we're not going to call it state of disaster anymore. Complete delusion going on there. <clears throat> anyway, thanks for the info about my microphone. I shall endeavor to do better. Um, one last thing that I want to refer to before we move into the burning platform a little later on, and again, we can address some of this in the burning platform too. The National Department of Health has presented its proposals to fund the national health insurance, including new taxes. <laughs> this is the Department of Health that had at its head the man you just mentioned, Zuelim Kize, who hardly, I mean, he, he had a great run in the beginning of COVID, people were saying, oh, he's, what a great minister of health this guy is, even while he was helping himself to money on the side through dodgy tenders and what is it called digital vibes. Um, have we not seen over the course of the mismanagement and improper administration of the health department in South Africa that giving these people more money is exactly the opposite of what we need to achieve in South Africa? But 
they're going ahead with this. They're going to try and use what, uh, whatever they can to find a way to push this NHI, National Health Insurance. So let's see what happens. Um, they, will, they will obviously want more tax. They're going to increase VAT, personal tax, company tax, and so on, and make SARS the bad guy here. The department added that the bulk of the required finances for the NHI is already in the system. <laughs> Who believes that? Do you believe that for me? Ah, ah, that's what I have to say about that. I mean, the very, government, take- the very government that is telling us that they want more of our tax money uh, the, the ANC, who makes up the, the majority of that government, certainly in the, in the executive part of the government, owes $100 million in tax themselves. So why don't they pay that and then worry about asking the rest of us for more tax money, says Congo Chris. I agree. It's ridiculous. We should all discuss the National Health Act and the proposed amendments, says Tony. Tony, that's what we're doing. And I agree. So thank you. <laughs> it's unreal. So, <laughs> By the, I, I don't think they'll have the time to bring it to light because I don't think that they have much longer in the positions that they have. So it'll be, they'll talk about it for the next couple of years. But <laughs> after the next election, they will have a significantly reduced amount of power and they will not be able to bring it to light. Well, from your mouth to God's ears, for me, let's see if that happens. That would be a good thing. All right. Uh, so apparently I'm sounding fine on the app, but on video it was breaking up, which is very weird. So apologies, but it seems like we're all back to normal now. Uh, thanks for letting me know. And we have the burning platform coming up next. So stick around for that. Get ready. Muzi Kuzwayo is going to be joining us. Of course, Muzi has been a guest before. He's just, uh, and, and the last time we had him on, he's putting together South Africa's Promise which uh, is a non-profit organization. The mission there is to fulfill South Africa's constitutional promise of freeing the potential of every person. Muzi, the last time he was on, was not afraid to say very controversial things. He has ideas, which we need at this point in this country. Everybody who asks about South Africa internationally and locally says, well, if not the ANC, what? Hopefully, Muzi provides exactly the answer that you're looking for to that question. That's certainly what I think. Maybe you agree or disagree. We will find out just now. I'll also reintroduce him to those of you who may not have uh, met Muzi before. But that's The Burning Platform, which is coming up next. Stick around. It is Thursday morning on cliffcentral.com. Don't go anywhere. Up next, next in the Auto Trader podcast. podcast. Do you think consumer living changed? Have, have, have you experienced some sort of... Some sort of, some sort of you know, over the years, over the, the change years, in tire prices. Tire prices. Um, I would, I would say, I would no. say no. And, uh, and, and, uh, the, and the reason, the, I, the reason I, I say that, say that, that is, is um, everybody, everybody has, has to replace tires during, during the life of the life ownership of their car, car at some point. some point. Yeah, yeah. But if you take but on, if you take average, on average, you buy a car, buy a car with, with, with new tires on it. You keep a car for maybe maybe five years. Okay, so you really only seeing the price every five years. Catch us every Monday at 9am on YouTube, on YouTube and on autotrader.co.za. Auto
you want to replace your glass half empty mentality with a glass half full mindset. I'm Barrett Edelstein and I present the Optimal Optimism podcast here on cliffcentral.com. Be empowered with practical tools around body, mind, food, exercise, and more to create a positive and abundant life. The Optimal Optimism podcast is made active by Virgin Active. Yes, indeed. We have a slew of new and interesting podcasts for you. If you don't like this show, I don't know why you're listening if you don't like this show, but there's lots of other stuff for you to listen to. <laughs> so you can go and have a look and uh, see if there's something that, um, that you like. There's something that would, uh, would, would fill the gap in your podcast playlist. I know I've got a playlist from here to eternity going on at the moment. There's so much I have to catch up on. I walk around my house during the day and even while I'm working, as long as it's not stuff I have to concentrate on, and I just have a podcast playing the whole time. If, if you saw me, you would know for sure that I'm not a bullshitter when it comes to believing in podcasts. I've been listening to these, these things for, what, 10, 15 years now, nonstop. And it's part of my life. It's something I absolutely love doing. And if you haven't got a podcast uh, you know, list that's going on yet, maybe you'll find the things that you're looking for on cliffcentral.com. Go and take a look and tell us what you think. Also, uh, obviously, spread it around. Give it the likes. Give it the shares. All that stuff that we need to spread it around to other people. Because there are still people in the world. I know it sounds ridiculous, but there are still people in the world who do not know about podcasting. I bumped into one or two of them yesterday. It's frightening. It's like uh, meeting someone from the 1800s. It's, um, it's absolutely bizarre. So it is time for the burning platform. Now, this morning, we have a return champion, someone who is uh, regularly featured in newspapers. He writes opinion pieces for everybody when they ask him to. But he's, uh, he's got opinions that he only shares with us. And I'm thrilled to have him back. Muzi Kuzwayo, his career started in advertising. Uh, today, he's the co-founder of South Africa's Promise, which I mentioned to you earlier. I did a a longer interview with Muzi about South Africa's Promise, the book which he has written, which is available online for free. Um, it is a nonprofit organization. The mission is to help fulfill South Africa's constitutional promise, pro promise rather, of freeing up the potential of each and every person. Muzi was a newspaper columnist for over 20 years. He wrote for various major South African newspapers, including the Sunday Times, City Press, and The Star. He continues to do that. He's also a former visiting professor at the University of Cape Town's Graduate School of Business, where he taught marketing through the paradigm of systems thinking. He's written several books and spoken to thousands of people in various forums, and that is why he believes South Africa is destined for greatness. So it is always good to see you. Let me welcome back uh, Pumi Mashiho, as always, for The Burning Platform. But today also, Muzi Kuzwayo. How are you, Muzi? Oh, well, thanks to you, Gareth. How are you? Good. It's nice to see you, and thank you for being on the show again. I hope we're not abusing, uh, abusing your your willingness to come and join us. But it's uh, there's no, so much. Not in the least. <laughs> thank you. Not in the least. All right. So, so Muzi, there's lots of uh, stuff in the news that we'll get to in a moment or two. But just from the outset, because you seem to be one of the uh, the wise elders in South Africa when it comes to trying to understand our place in the world. Uh, geopolitics is such a mess at the moment. Um, we've got. China and Russia, which I know are both subjects that you are very much conversant on and in. Um, China and Russia, we've got America, we've got this issue with the Ukraine at the moment. Are we seeing an east-west separation and are we seeing the potential for much more conflict or are we seeing that died down slightly? Because I'm hearing reports that Russia may have miscalculated um, on their side how effective their military may have been against the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians have fought very hard and very bravely. And I think many people are starting to look at this and going, well, is it going to go anywhere? Is it going to get worse, as predicted? Or is it actually going to just fizzle out? What's your take on, on the Ukraine situation, which is the big geopolitical question of the moment? Yes. Gareth, you know, I'm really interested in the evolution of things uh, and how things change, how great powers gain their power or lose their power, and lose their power, in fact, over time. So if we look at things, I mean, the war's only been five or six weeks old. If we only look at that, we will not understand the greater forces um, that are shaping the world. One of the books, so uh, because I love the evolution of things, I mean, I've looked at how it, evolution of cameras, the evolution of photography, 
mm. and what impact it's got in the liberation of slaves. Uh, and so when we look at the Ukraine, the, the Russia-Ukraine war, just what, what is happening now, we are likely to lose the big picture. So it's not the first time that Russia has been to war, or at least Putin has been to war. He went to war in, in Georgia in 2008, and again in Ukraine in 2014, annexed um, uh, Crimea. Yeah. So we don't know what his objective is, because by, war, by, by nature, as Karl von Klausov is writing his book on strategy, on war rather, which is strategy on war, the objectives are always kept hidden. We can only deduce. And he says, actually, if that's what, because of the nature of war, you've got to get your best brains trying to analyze what is what the adversary is trying to do. So I saw one analyst asking, what if Putin is achieving his objectives? What, is if, what if his objective is just to ruin uh, Kyiv or Ukraine to scare any other country and not to take the land because that will be difficult. That will be taking him back to Afghanistan. He did not hold Georgia in, 20, in 2008. He did not hold uh, Ukraine again. He just annexed Crimea. And Donbas um, is it's probably a proxy, not against Ukraine per se, but against the United States. But what is happening in the greater geopolitical space is that when you look at the evolution of things, how great powers look, lose their power. I think the West, or America in particular, is losing its grip in the same way that, that Great Britain lost its grip in 1957, you could argue, or mm -hmm. some in 1980, it was in 1980, when the flag came down for the last time in, in what was then Rhodesia, uh, because Hong Kong was, the agreement had been done 50 years earlier. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and why we say this, it's because America pulled out of Afghanistan pretty much like they pulled out of Vietnam, running one. So what is happening now in the Middle East, for instance, is that the Arab countries no longer trust America to be their protector. In the same way, for instance, uh, they're learning what uh, Lesotho learned, that you could, they could no longer get Great Britain to be their protector. Remember, Lesotho was a protectorate of Great Britain. So those things happen from time to time. Um, they see what's happened in Libya. And what are the Arab countries doing now? They're going to Israel to be their protector, as it were, because they don't have the armies or the people. And right. Israel is the leader in technology. Right. So Israel now becomes the de facto defender of the Arab countries. Isn't that ironic? I mean, the, it's so ironic that America for years has been trying to be the, 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 the peacemaker and, and the you know, the, the, the facilitator for Middle East peace. And all they had to do maybe was get out of the way. <laughs> well, it's time, Gareth. You know, um, um, it, it, because of evolution of things, you have to, I, I, I thought I had to understand the forces, the elements that cause the acceleration and deceleration of progress. So these are countries that don't have the most ferocious armies. What do they depend on? depend on? They depend on, so they need drones. So look at what happened recently in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian war. Uh, the Tigray forces were, were about 100 kilometers from, from taking Addis Ababa. Uh, Mohammed Abe went to, to Turkey, got drones, and they were able to push them back. So uh, Saudi Arabia is struggling to, to take over Yemen or to pacify Yemen. Who's got the technology to do that kind of thing? It's the Israel. Mm -hmm. So the world is changing rapidly. And, and, and having grown up during apartheid and the change of apartheid, I remember full well when the African National Congress had to change from being supported by the Communist Party to having great relationships with the United States of America. So it happens. You know, America replaced Great Britain. Somebody else is going to replace uh, America. That's just how it goes. So who's, get, who's that? Is that China? Um, you see, China does do not have an expansion, or at least um, we're going to re, uh, revoke, we're going to evoke uh, um, from it here. China mm -hmm. have said they, they have a peaceful, ex, they don't have an expansionist philosophy, one, but they want to grow peacefully, unlike America. But we don't know what their true intentions are. But we must also remember that China has been a trading nation for centuries. They made the first 
huge investment in Africa when uh, Ian Smith declared the, the, you know, the UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence, and kept the trains in, the, on, in, in Rhodesia, on the Rhodesia side, and Zambia had no connection to the sea. It was Mao Zedong who put a $2 billion train. It's still there called Tazara, the Tazara Line. So they've always done that in various countries. Um, will they be the next superpower? They may well become the de facto superpower because everybody else has fallen, as it were. Right. So I, I hate to go from like these big, um, heavy and, and, and meaningful Gra conversations of gravitas to things that are that are much more they, they seem a little more stupid but we do have you know our own place in the world and and i often think about south africa especially now that i've done a little bit more traveling again for the first time in two years i think of our place in the world and i think about how we always consider ourselves to be the very worst you know south africans have this attitude of like south africa is this embarrassing backwater and we don't really have much to give the world and we squandered all of our our, our moral capital after 1994 and things are just terrible and there's nothing to celebrate and we look at the unemployment rate and stuff that is that is a genuine issue but we're really hard on ourselves and as Pumi and I were discussing at the start of the show today we tend to complain more than anyone else but we would be outside of all these massive maneuvers and maybe that's a very advantageous place to be we've got to sort out our own backyard obviously but I don't think that South Africa is necessarily positioned terribly badly if the world is going to change as fast as you say it is and as we can observe it is what do you what do you feel about south africa's place in this new world you know like everything there's an opportunity you know and the opposite of opportunity obviously is the complete loss of, of that opportunity hmm. we are losing our best brains we shouldn't fool ourselves um this afternoon i'm meeting a guy who's leaving the country young Black guy I've known, well, young guy that I've known for years, you know, uh, he was still five years old. He's going, he's moving to Japan. Uh, on Monday, somebody else left. And on the show, Pumi was, was interviewing Kaya Stoda, and he said that about 120 black CAs who left the country, who live in London. So we do have a problem, and we've got to do something about it. We've got to change things right now and immediately. Complaining is good, you know. Uh, there are two things. I think we've also inherited what Churchill says in, in his book, uh, My African Journey. He mm -hmm. says, white men in, in Africa, they just love to complain. They complain about phones. They complain about the sun. They complain about everything. <laughs> it's in our nature, right? He uh, says, they come the white, he talks to this one guy who's complaining. The bureaucrats haven't given me papers for my farm and all of that kind of things. He says, you know, the Scots don't complain on the other hand of the other end of the world, and they're really poor, you know? Yeah. But we've got to change things. And what is lacking in this generation, and what is likely to make us lose the opportunity, is this generation, Gen Z, and everybody else who's, who's alive around, is they lack what the greatest generation had. We are beneficiaries of the greatest generation, men like Nelson Mandela, the guys who were born in Tom... Uh, uh, Prabhu talked about the greatest generation as the people who were influenced and who also fought in this, who were influenced in the, by the First World War, Second World War, and understood the importance of sacrifice. This generation gets everything. We are beneficiaries of the guys who were in Our freedom is a result of the people who went to war in the Second World War in Europe and came back and accelerated the freedom that we had. Difficult as it was. Yeah. And what are we doing? This generation, unfortunately, is looking at getting everything for self. We live in the world of, in, in the era of the selfie, that everything should be for me. You know, mm -hmm. what are you doing for me as opposed to what am I doing for society and for the future? And that difference, that, that's, you talk about small things and big things. Actually, you know, that old saying, Gareth, that says the butterfly that flaps in its wings in Durban will, end up, will, will lead to a hurricane in, in, in Florida. So it's the small things that make the big, the big things. If everybody is more concerned about themselves, we're going to sink into the abyss of history and never be the people who are going to have a better future and play a greater and better role in, um, 
in the, in the future. And Gareth, without taking it too long, we're not the first people to be colonized. We should stop feeling sorry for ourselves. Yeah. You know, uh, in the birth of Britain, also by, by Churchill, when it tells you the 400 years of colonization by the Romans and the chaos that follows after the, libera the liberation, as it were, but they still went on to be the greatest empire in the world. Now, I don't believe in, in empires or us being an empire, but the fact that we've been through the fire gives us the opportunity to be better people and create a better na nation. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, people always think that that Europe was this uh, was, was this uh, this ascendant power throughout history, and it really wasn't. I mean, the Ottoman Empire, for 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 a large part of what the West called the Dark Age, was the only place that was a repository of knowledge, scientific and and mathematic mathematic mathematical development, uh, philosophy. If it weren't for the Ottoman Empire and for Baghdad and Cairo, frankly, we may not have inherited any of that wisdom of the of the ancient world. There were also huge developments going on in the Far East, in China, in Japan. There were advanced civilizations in, in Mesoamerica. I, I spent a bit of time there now, and it was interesting for me to hear about slavery that occurred there long before the white man came. And, you know, this idea that, that any of the suffering of humankind belongs only to one group of us is ridiculous and we've got to we've also in south africa got to stop feeling sorry for ourselves and realize that it's up to us this is why i love what you're doing with south africa's promise and we'll maybe have some more time a little later to delve into that but it is the burning platform so we've got some practical stuff to deal with today so pumi where do we want to start today because there's a lot to talk about you mentioned batabile Lamini earlier do you want to just maybe start there because it's an easy one to tick off the list no i look i think that they are lots of different things, but they all boil down to one thing. And and I think Muzi, when you say we're unwilling to sacrifice is what we see in our political sphere. You know, we see a lot of politicians all about self. They, you know, mm -hmm. we see our governing party is all about self. You know, so that that was a, a very interesting kind of way of looking at all of the various things. So Batamile Lamini is very interested in keeping herself out of jail and not really want, worried about the bigger party that she represents and what her fight, her little personal fight, what damage it does to the bigger party. If we think about our president, and he said on many occasions that he is the president of the ANC before the president of the country. Again, is looking at the small self-interest and keeping right. himself in that job and not really worrying about the bigger job of the country. And, you know, I, I think even as you go across the board, when you look at what's happening at the DA, you know, and their own internal little fights, if you look at what's happening at Action SA with their little internal fights, they're all reflective of that selfie generation. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Lizzie? You see, it's... um. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's dying organizations. That's what is the, the problem is that, I mean, the na it's in the name, isn't it? African National Congress set up to fight colonialism and, and apartheid later, when, in the later years. Those things are now gone. So the reason for existence has basically been wiped away. That's what has happened. And now they're battling with trying to keep on living in an era that no longer is no longer right for them. It's like bacteria that uh, or anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that live in a non-oxygen world, trying to evolve very quickly and live in a world where everybody lives off oxygen. So that is actually what is happening. It's the end of an era. And if you look at history and the evolution of things, um, it's it's exactly that. It's, it, it's in so many things, things that we see, cameras, um, the camera business trying to survive in the world where everybody has got a camera and a cell phone without having to le learn photography. Mm -hmm. So, and, and trying to hold on to those parties will not help us pr uh, go forward. It's, it's, it's anti-progress. It's the opposite of progress. What, what we this? now need are new parties that are, are not based on black versus white um, or this one against that. But understanding that progress, a very good example of progress is in an aeroplane. Whether you're sitting on the left or on the right, on the right seats does not matter. We all have to behave according.
accordingly for the journey to be safe. And we're going to go through storms. We're going to go through a lot of things. So the politics as we knew it of, I mean, nations with, I mean, even Europe, they, went, they had no nations, but tribes that came together to fight the Romans, that fought the, yeah. in England, to fight the Germans, the Saxons, and all of those things. When all, when the conflicts are gone, the people whose only job was to have conflict, was to keep the conflict going or to win, then they don't know how to behave in a peaceful world. Well, there's this, the world this, is far more this, peaceful today than it was back, back then. Absolutely. Uh, there's this brilliant article that I remember reading years ago called St. George the Dragon Slayer in Retirement Syndrome. And it's basically, oh, wow. about, <laughs> basically about how, you know, the, the legend goes that St. George slays the dragon and yeah. then he finds himself with nothing to do. So he keeps slaying ever smaller and smaller dragons until he can eventually use like a kebab skewer to, to get the last one. And they so, the, the dragons are so small eventually that it makes a, him seem ridiculous. And it's kind of like that with a lot of these organizations, not just the ANC, but even the opposition parties whose whole purpose is to be opposed to the ANC. That's not a real purpose anymore. They need to have more on their plate and maybe it's time for them to die. You know, Muzi, you very, are you very much upset, um, Lebang, when you were on our show and you said that the old voters in South Africa, that the, the people over a certain age who are going to the polls and still voting in certain ways, that those people need to die for us to move on. And I remember she was horrified. She was horrified. By but we, you know, in order for evolution, which is a word you've used a couple of times today, to actually start to make a difference, evolution doesn't occur while you're alive. It occurs when the next generation is born. Absolutely. You know, I think humans have got this obsession with living forever. But there was time in history, in natural history, where we did not exist. You know? Yeah. And yes. there, there will come a time where we're gone as well. I mean, the dinosaurs, I'm sure, would have loved to live. But what we want to try and be as comfortable for as many, for many people as is possible. I got a guy yesterday, uh, Freddy Subawana, gave me, gave me he, drew, he drew up a plan for the uh, development of his, um, of his village. People who are over 50, in, who are over 60 yeah, in his village make only 5% of the village. So that's, it's the nature of things. We are going to die. And the people, I mean, for all the people who love, all the Rivonia childists are now gone. That's just nature. That's how life is. But you know, Gareth, what is also important is we need to, live, to uplift the standard of people. And what has happened? Um, Curtis Mayfield said, we people who are darker than blue, <laughs> meaning black people. <laughs> when our leaders do not deliver what they're supposed to deliver as leaders, they blame the others. It's the white man's fault. It's the white monopoly capital. White monopoly capital, but you've got the keys. But because a lot of the guys who are either leaders, CEOs, were raised in captivity. Mm -hmm. You know, like you lead, lead a lion, you let a lion take a lion that was raised in the zoo and you try and take it back to the, to the wild, it's going to be dead in two weeks from starvation or from being taken out by other lions. They have not learned or thought of how can we make life better for our children? I always I said to one guy, you know, I was really upset and I'm, I'm really sorry I, 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 that I said that. I said to him, you know, I think to you white people are a ghost. You see them even where they don't exist. You are in trouble because of your actions, but you think somebody else with some powers greater than yours has put you in this. So it's the way we think. And what we need to do is, and particularly the younger generation, is to start making those sacrifices. To find, and sacrifice meaning, sacrificing means leaving the things that are dear to you. Like when you're at the top of, the, of, 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 of your career in, on radio, <laughs> on the hill, you go and do a crazy things, you step down from the mountain, back to the, to, to the fields and plant something that is new called podcasting. And everybody thinks you're crazy and advertisers don't want to come to you because they think this, this has got no future. And then the world suddenly changes. And nobody remembers the sacrifices that were made to that and the beatings, the personal beating and asking yourself, am I crazy? Is this the right thing to do? 
Now, I'm appealing to a lot of other people who are in great corporate positions to say, guys, you're doing exceptionally well now, but this is the time to make sacrifice. You are making no sacrifice if you're at the bottom of the, of the, of, of the valley anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no sacrifice to make. So it's to leave the, the things that we hold very dearly to do something that is new and in helping communities, in helping society, in helping the country, our own personal successes come as a result of that. I always say to people, success is like a shadow. You chase it, you can't catch it. You walk away, it follows you. You just have to do what you have to do all the time. And it's right beside you all the time. Sure. Um, I mean, this is this is also where I'm, I'm, I'm probably bringing her into this conversation without her permission, but this is where LeBang would be saying amen. I mean, you know, <laughs> what, what, you, what you're indicating here, though, Muzi, is a very difficult thing because people don't like to give up on the things they know. And especially when it comes to culture and history and politics, people love holding on to that stuff. And you see it all over the world. Long after an idea has died, there are still those who keep those fires burning. Um, and it's important sometimes for people to feel either like they're oppressed or that they're the oppressor. Um, some people never let go of that stuff. And if we're to move ahead, if I understand you correctly, we need to start thinking about ourselves very differently. Um, but, I, I, I love this country, but we, we've got a long way to go before we get to where you are. But you know what you see currently is a lot of people think that the voting majority don't know how to vote for anybody but the ANC. But when you look at the fact that we have got a declining number of people showing up to vote, then you know that it's, their problem is not not knowing how to vote for the ANC. It is also not knowing who else to vote for. You know, right. So they, they would rather stay home then show up and vote for what's there. And that, that's where the, the paradigm is, right? So when Wizzy talks about we need to do new things, it's also because people are going, if I'm not going to vote for the ANC, I'm not going to vote for an EFF that is an ANC light, or I'm not going to vote for an IFP that is a very parochial small party all the way over there, or I'm not going to vote for a DA that has positioned itself as anti-ANC. So I'd rather just not vote. So there's a, a lot of work that we all have to do in, in society that then says, how do we bring about an alternative that answers the questions that the voting electorate needs? Okay, but then... I, I think more than voting, we need to build a society. You know, yeah. Uh, build, but people, we had I mean, during AIDS, a lot of adults died, and about a third of our population, ten percent, was really gone. We have, we have to rebuild society. Little things such as manners, uh, understanding and respecting others, how we talk to each other, what responsibility means, what humility means, which is difficult in the era of the selfie. <laughs> but if you look at at how the British did it, it was, I mean, it was the most brutal thing. So when the Romans, I mean, Rome kind of collapsed. So the province that was Great Britain, that was Britain at the time, was now difficult to hold. You know, the, the Germans were fighting. And then the elite was, I mean, the structure of Britain is pretty much based on the Roman structure. You know, the, the lords, the guys who hold the land, you know, the, the, the right. Caesar, the guys who hold the land, and then they had the slaves. And then the, you know, the commoners as well. So when Rome is suddenly, so in that period, there are guys, some British guys were now, you know, they're wearing togas, they were like the Romans. The British, when they were liberating Britain, they killed those guys off. Found you in the, in the, in the, in the, in the baths, because the Romans had the Roman baths. They killed everybody there. It was the most brutal way of dealing with it. But we have to find, firstly, because we live in a peaceful world and as South Africa, we are not... We, we live in a, in a civilized world. In South Africa, we, it's not our DNA. Our DNA is peace. You know? mm. uh, we, we are at our best when we are kinder to one another. Sure. And we have to rebuild that. Um, build society, give people opportunity. Because if people have got opportunity,
opportunity. They then able, they are then able to share. So one of the ways that empires have fallen and crumbled, Gareth and Pumi, is when they exclude certain members of their own society. And when that happens, opportunity diminishes. And when opportunity diminishes, the, the best people leave. So um, the most important thing is to bring people, is to give people their dignity. As down in KZN, where you still see people um, have to go and fetch water 1,6 kilometers away. Yeah. That's, that's creating a systemic disadvantage. And who do you blame for that? You can go on and go on in history. What would you say? This one did that, that one. But the people who are in charge, now I read a lovely book many years ago when I was still a youngster called the Africans. And one of the leaders in Africa, they were talking about how things are changing. He said, well, we've been elected to change things. We cannot complain about colonialism because we've been given the explicit task of changing things. And if we fail to change things, then we've failed at our duty. And right. this thing needs the best brains, and which is why I would call on younger people. I mean, Cliff Central is, is a very successful station now, but it started with you saying, I'm leaving this big station that I'm offering the opportunity and all the great and many endorsements. So whether you're a chartered accountant, you're a lawyer, you're an engineer, you've got to think of how, what, what is it that I must sacrifice that is important to me. That will make the country a better person and me a better person in and the long run. And Muzi, I love that because this is going to address the question I was going to interrupt and raise just now about unemployment. Because we're never going to create jobs for this, this, this country's vast majority of people who sit with no opportunities unless we take chances. And in order to take chances, it means getting out of your comfort zone. And for many people, that's just not on the, on the cards. People are not willing to sacrifice anything because they go, well, I can just keep doing this forever. What they don't realize is that you can't keep doing anything forever. Sometimes things just die under you if you think you can keep riding them. You know, you take the horse as far as it can go. But even if you've still got lots of energy and the horse is dead, you're going to stop wherever the horse dies. I'm concerned with what you've just raised now, that we've got all these people who haven't got meaningful, gainful purpose or employment. They wake up in the mornings and there's nothing for them to do. They can go and look. They can go and seek. They can ask until they're blue in the face. And many of them do. I get emails. I'm sure you do every day from young people in this country who are looking for a place to make a difference. And there's just not enough opportunity. But that's also because in South Africa, we expect someone else to do the work for us. There are opportunities here. And I said to Pumi earlier, having just been to Mexico and having thought about these very rule-based, rigid societies like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, you know, places where people want to live according to many, many rules. They have bureaucracies that are on full employment, busy making new rules and bylaws every other day. In a country like ours, where mostly it's a bit like the Wild West, that presents a huge opportunity for people to go and exploit gaps in the market, find things that aren't being mined at the moment. And I don't mean mining as in you know, digging things out of the ground, but exploit opportunities that are there for us to take. And, and people just need to be brave enough to take a chance. Do you think that's possible? Do you think that we can solve our problems by doing that? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you say you've been to Mexico, and I've, I've been to Mexico, and because I love walking, I found myself in, myself in places where later on people told me that, did you really go there? You know, when, when I go to the airport, I have this thing, Gareth, I'm always suspected of being a drug dealer. <laughs> so I went to, I went to, to Mexico and got, I was detained. <laughs> And, and, um, and, and I must say this, I was flying from, I, flew from, I flew in from London, so get off the plane, I said, let me go to the bathroom. Someone says, nah, man, I'm not going to the bathroom, no, I'll just go through the bathroom, I'll go through the gates and then I'll go to the bathroom. And I got detained at the gates. So mm -hmm. there I was, sitting now, well, there's no bathroom, there's nothing else to do, and I was made to write my name and address five times. But that happens, it's happened to me in many countries, so it doesn't bother me. Um, <laughs> And then I went to some, but, and I saw these two guys. I mean, Mexico's got a problem with uh, kidnappings and, and, and stuff. Yeah. 
Well, I saw these two guys. I said, hey, these guys, they look a little dodgy, you know? The way they're looking around. And I said, hey, but they're going to struggle. With this African, they're going to end up into the much more. And, I, and then we drove to, to various parts of Mexico because we worked on a project. And found some, and on the way, we drove on the, on the road, um, uh, deserted factories, cocaine factories, with airplanes mm. that had been, that, that had been mothballed and dogs around them and the kind of thing. It was a terrible thing. And I fear at times that our country will go that way when people don't have opportunity. You know, the Mexicans have a saying. Um, the, the, I, I asked the, 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 my host there, I said, why is Mexico so poor? I mean, in relation to America on the other side, and not part, okay. lots of, of parts of, of, of Mexico actually look like, like California. It looks like an extension of California. And he quoted, uh, he told me a quote from one of the old Mexican presidents. He said, the problem with Mexico, I mean, you remember in Mexico, there are churches everywhere, you know, mm. shrines somewhere you can, even during lunch hour, you can go on your knees and pray or something like that, everywhere. And he said, the problem with Mexico is that it's too far from God and too close to America. <laughs> and our problem here in South Africa is that we are too, I think we are, too close to God, to, to the politicians that are too far from God. We think everything will come from our politicians, everything will, from the, will come from the mm -hmm. government. Actually, mm -hmm. it won't. You know? So we, young people who are chartered accountants today, who are engineers, who are teachers, who are everything that makes South African life, must now think about being the policymakers, about yeah. being the politicians. Because if you really think about it, who's the next? President Mbalula? Are you going to have President Masina? Is that what we're looking for? <laughs> well, that's put the fear of God into some people. Here's a, here's a quote from, from Corona's Boring, who's paraphrasing, but he's, he's saying exactly what you're saying here. South Africans, the average attitude in South Africa is ask not what we can do for our country, but what our country can do for us, which is the opposite of what Kennedy said, right? Mm. Mm. You know, but, and Kennedy is also from that great generation of, of, of Tom Bracco, you know, of he'd been influenced by the Second World War, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so they had humility and they believed in what can we do, you know. They, that's why we had some of the greatest teachers. Education blossomed in that, in that era. And, and what we are looking at is what is the government they haven't given us this. They haven't given us houses. They haven't given mm -hmm. us anything. So, but they've set up the rules and the laws of the country that make it so difficult for anybody to do anything. So, which leaves us with only one opportunity to be the lawmakers, to get up there and make the right policies, scrap all the nonsense that is holding back our country and holding back the future of young people. You know, if you look at something, and I'm a, I'm a beneficiary, I guess, of, of black economic empowerment and the beneficiary of, 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 of affirmative action before that, and I'm really appreciative of it. But like you, make it, you made an example with the horse. The horse can't run for 100 years. After a while, it's going to die in order to get another horse. The BE horse has been great for a lot of politicians. Affirmative action has been great for people like me. But that horse can't run anymore. Mm. We've got to find a new horse for us to continue. But there's a level of one of the things that sacrifice takes is it also takes a level of being brave, which is something a lot of people lack. You need to be brave and confident. So when you have the opportunity to be brave and make the right decisions or make the difficult decisions, you know, it's something, and, and that's not going to come from the politicians, and it's not going to come from outside of us. Each one of us has to find it within ourselves to be brave enough to go against the grain. You know, to be brave enough, Gareth, to walk away from a big, established SABC station and start something new and try something new. To be brave enough when you are given an opportunity uh, because of affirmative action or because of UEE, to keep the door open and bring in more people rather than be afraid to say, if, if I 
if I don't hold everything for myself, it's all going to mm-hmm. end. And that you've got to open it up. We've got to open ourselves up in our hearts, I suppose. But it's about being brave as well, being brave enough to do something different. You, you know, Mumia, I think bravery is, there's a very fine line between bravery and madness. Yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Some people will just walk on the fire and you're like, are you crazy? <laughs> you know? yeah. And I think circumstances push you. You need that little push. Um, and you've got to find that. I always remember an incident. I went to university with the North of Tiflo. I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to use the K word because that's what the police used. Oh, my God. And they were beating up this guy. This is good. This is good. If, if we've had anything on, the, anything on the burning platform that will get us fired, it's what movie we're going to do now. So this guy gets beaten up at Tiflo, but you know, it was a state of emergency. The soldiers and the police took over the campus mm. and they were searching room to room. So they beat him up. And then he, eventually he goes like, ah, oh, he's the F word. You don't know, fuck no, man. You know, fuck you. And they keep beating him up. And then the one cop says, the cover us no what? Come on, come on, slow If he had not been brave enough to say, okay, do whatever you want to do, you could have killed him in what they were they saw as playing. Hmm. So at some stage, we've got to be, we are in a situation where we are actually going to die as a country. I keep reminding people, Gareth, that Iran, Persia, and Somalia invented the post office. Probably the greatest communication line that changed society forever. But look at where they are today. Somalians are everywhere around the world trying to make a living. Doing well, some doing very badly, and being attacked everywhere around the world. Unfortunately, South Africa is now at that point, not at Somalia's level, but we have got our toes dipping in that pond of poverty. Mm -hmm. We've got lots of young people living in the country, black and white, who... uh, manage the COVID response between the EU and Belgium is a South African. Yeah. She loves her country, would love to see her mom every day or at least every week. But she's had to leave the country of, that she loves because it cannot give her opportunity. We must stop that. And the only way that we can stop that is for the guys who have done very well, who are very successful, to make sacrifices. It'll be hard, but that's what sacrifice is about, but the reward will be great. Yeah, you know, um, sacrifice is, is an interesting, I, I love, by the way, I love having Muzi on because we don't, we don't just talk about specifics and, and, you know, moan about this character or that character. We talk a, a bit more philosophically about what we can do. And, and this is real stuff. People can, in small ways and big ways, make sacrifices. But the interesting thing about sacrifice is it's, it's obviously there are religious overtones and connotations to it, which some people like and some people don't. But it, it is a basic, it's a, it's a conclusion that we can make from all the greatest achievements of humanity. That unless you are prepared to forego enjoyment, satisfaction, pleasure, uh, happiness, comfort for the moment, unless you're prepared to, to put that on hold and invest it in the future, there is no future for you. Uh, and, well, yeah. that's, that's the lesson of sacrifice, right? Is that, is that tomorrow must be better than today, but in order to make tomorrow better than today, you have to be willing to forego some of those things today. Well, Gareth, you know, the English language is steeped in Latin, and Latin is, is got the, 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 the Roman Catholic Christianity. So mm-hmm. English, by its very nature, is based on Christianity. Words like justice. <laughs> you mm-hmm. can't run away from that, you know? You, A vision. Yeah. Mission, it's, it's English. It's, 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 very, it's deep on that. So if, if for people who don't like, I've got a friend who always says that, who says, no, why do you have to talk about religion? It's English. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's a Latin word, <laughs> language, you know? Right. So, so um, and because the Romans conquered them, you know? So, but, but the thing is, you have to give up something. Let's call it an investment. You've right. got to forgo the pleasures of now and today for greater profits later on, or even a profit, you might lose it. 
you know? Right. But that's what it's about. It's about what is it that is very important to me that I hold dear, that I may need to give up. You know, like I always say, the chickens sacrifice their lives every day to keep us alive. Uh, we eat them and eggs and everything. That's just how it goes. You know, you've got to give up something. They don't get any reward because they're in the lower part of the food chain. But we've got to give up things we love for the greater good. And it's the greater good that makes the species alive, even in evolution. Um, some of the things that we do are good, are pleasurable, and others are unpleasurable. You know, so I saw a comment earlier. One of the people said, is it fair to put an extra burden or extra load on doctors, engineers, and all that kind of stuff when politicians should actually do their job and we should get better at choosing the politicians. One of the things I say on the show all the time is you don't have to, you know, what sacrifice means or what what the investment was is talking about doesn't mean you have to add to what you currently have. Maybe it's taking a five year sabbatical to get into a position in a in, in a government department. Maybe it is to be part of a new and growing organization and bring your skill into that organization. You may not earn what you earn in your current high flying engineer job, mm -hmm. but you are able to create and build something better than what we have. Maybe it's volunteering your time at an organization over the weekend or two hours a day, but using the skill that you already have in the places that are needed. We, Musi was talking about the thing in, in KZN with the water. Maybe mm. you are, you know, water engineer and you can sacrifice three hours of your time to donate to an NGO that is doing something in that water sphere that needs that kind of expertise. Now that you, you know that you have to think and be creative to find the solutions because the solutions are not coming from the politicians that we have right now. Maybe we need a president who's an engineer. <laughs> True. Mean, True. Jimmy, maybe we need an, an, a president who's an accountant. Jimmy Carter was an engineer. And what the difference between a man was. Shogun Reagan was an actor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the second. <laughs> you always yeah. read your career, right? The, but, is a the, the, the difference in, in Ukraine, when they had the, the explosion of, uh, in, of the nuclear in many years ago. Chernobyl, yeah. Chernobyl, which is in Ukraine, that's right. And, and in America, they had a similar accident, but because Jimmy Carter right? was an engineer, he knew which questions to ask as things were going wrong. Okay, have you done this? Have you taken care of this? You've taken care of that. Politics is not the preserve of the imbeciles. We need better people to run the country. We need you yeah, do it for yeah. 10 years. You don't have to be a lifer. You do it for 10 years. You go back to your career, you'll be a better person. You would have set up the policies. Um, Ernest Oppenheimer was a politician at some stage. So um, representing Kimberly, and MP. there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's we've got to get the best people, the best minds, solving the problems for us to get better solutions. I can't see Vatabile. She has not. I mean, she messed up Sasa. Mm. Uh, I can't see her. And one day she may become president. The way things work at the ANC. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, this is the this is the question. This is the question, and and I think most of us know that we want something better, right? And and this is what's kind of kept us together through the the, the last couple of years, where we've seen everything falling apart around us. Um, is that we we do know that we want our kids to grow up better than us. We do know that we want the country to start developing and catching up and making more opportunities for our own citizens, and we also know that we've got real world challenges and sometimes people just look at this and go it's too big for me to handle yeah yeah that's true gareth but you know what the butterfly that flaps its wings yeah. in Durban right. Chaos theory, yeah. a hurricane mm -hmm. in, 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 on the other side of the world it's ordinary people who do great things um and and they try them 
and they fail and they make mistakes. But that's what human being human is about. You know, um, I, I, I love how the dog world has progressed in society from living on it off a chain and barking and running around to living in the lounge and being fed some of the best food. <laughs> so uh, it's life is like that. There is progress. So yeah. we've got to, it, it's the hardships that, we, that, that make us human. And that's the difference between us and the dog life. Um, so, so people must, I mean, we're going towards, I know we, we're going towards Easter which is basically about liberation to a large extent, leaving Egypt, leaving your own Egypt, mm -hmm. greatness. Um, so, so that's where we, that, that, these things that, you know, as I love the way Churchill talks about King Arthur. So for, for, I always thought there was, I had a friend from Germany whose name was Arthur. So I thought Arthur was a real, was a real person, had been a real king. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's what I read. I mean, I'm not English and I did, everything in Bandu education, we never learned about King Arthur and those guys. <laughs> and he says, the legend of King Arthur never really happened, but it gives us hope. You know, I'm gonna, you know you, you, whatever you think of, 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 of Easter, but it's the, 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 the hope that you can walk through water, that the water will split, the oceans will split, if need be, for you to walk across. So, Whatever difficulty there is, I mean, I remember when media planners were used to tell, were telling me that no, podcasts will never take off. We don't have bandwidth in this country. You know what? Data is too expensive. Data is too expensive. Things split in half. Podcasts are everywhere for people to walk on dry land. That's what these great myths are about. That they will be all the forces against you. But data will split in half. Somebody will sell it for half the price. And you'll be able to reach people. It's really that, you know. So that's what it is. Yeah, you know, um, I've, I've got to refer to something completely ridiculous here that uh, someone brought up. But it's something that you'll enjoy, uh, Muzi. Uh, Sanele says, ha, ha, ha. I always said Muzi looks like King Dalindiebo. That's why they keep arresting him at airports. That's why they keep asking him. <laughs> they, because they, know about, they know about King Dalindiebo and the, the problems he'd had with drugs. <laughs> uh, uh, I, we, we had great respect for his father. Um, and you know, you know this thing of xenophobia, Gareth? I, was, yeah. I grew up in Springs. So I hate xenophobia, and for many reasons. And one of them is that it starts by saying illegal foreigners. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly, it disintegrates to neighbors. Right. So um, in the 70s, because of the forced removals, we had to, I mean, they moved, literally, they were looking for closer people and moving them out of painful. And when we grew up, we used to sing a song, which I still... We, I still, it's in my mind because we sang it right up until high school. We used to say, Gulu Sizi, Gulu Sizi, Guma Tosa, Oya Bizuma Tanzima. And then we'd invoke, we'd cry and say, Wema Sabata, Wema Sabata, Ninaga Dalinje. Oh, yeah. So we'd ask Dalinje was mom to intervene because they're rounding up all the closer people. I lost two friends. Koi Koi, Spongi, those are the two I remember. And, and something, so, and they were all, they kind of, they were taken away. They moved to a place that they'd never known. Some of their parents never knew. And you know, very sadly, oh, I don't know, there's a guy, there were two guys that I went to varsity with. Um, and then the one I was telling a story about drinking horse urine because we guys used to believe that horse urine makes you strong. <laughs> so I'm telling the story of a guy who, you know, and when horses were urinating, it's just like, it's, it's gushing. Wow. Yeah. And this guy went underneath the horse and drank the urine as it was coming off the horse. So I'm telling the story, and Simon turns around and says, you're lying. I'm going like, why would I lie about this? He says, where were you when that happened? I said, I was there, I was in the cart. He says, because I was there too. So I meet this guy, I meet this guy 18 years later, and then we find out, I find out that his mom and my mom were great friends. They grew up together. 
Oh, yeah? First rulers did that. They split people out of, apart very, very t in a terrible way. And those kinds of things, that's what xenophobia does. So it's not, xenophobia is very, it's, it's, it's like touching a raw heart for me that's still beating, you know? And I think it's got to be stopped because also imagine when other countries decide that they are having sanctions against South Africa. Right. There will be no trade. This 74% unemployed youth will quickly go to 100%. But unfortunately, our leadership is so limited in vision and thinking, they cannot see the damage that they are causing through their silence and sometimes tacit and overt support of this nonsense. Well, Muzi, I'm glad you brought up this xenophobia thing because it's such an issue at the moment and there's all this talk about Nslantla Lux and Operation Dudula. And we, we've seen politicians behaving really irresponsibly when it comes to xenophobia. I mean, you have any other just kind of parting shot because we've got literally two, three minutes left of this, of, of, of our, place, our place in Africa because we, you know, <laughs> it always starts at home. So it's your own house, your own neighborhood, your own municipality your own province your own nation and then the continent that you're a part of before you start thinking about ukraine and russia what do you what do you think well, of the situation at the moment in south africa a lot going? of countries in africa a lot of people are disappointed yeah because they were hoping that post all the polo, the post colonial poverty and despotism had come to an end that we were the actual star that was blossoming, uh, that was going to grow and create positivity throughout the continent. And President Thabo Mbeki started with African Renaissance, isn't it? Right. And you know, Gareth, I, I, I got something very interesting. You remember, you might remember that Mandela wanted to appoint Cyril Ramaphosa to be his, his deputy. That's right. Apparently, the person who spoke Mandela out of it, talked Mandela out of it, was Julius Nyerere. He said, mm. you don't know this guy, one. And number two, uh, we, don't, we, we know we've trained Thabo Mbeki on Pan-Africanism, that he's going to help the continent come back. You know, when I think about that now, I think Nyerere came to our great help because can you imagine how terrible things would have been? For, you know, um, just four years ago, when I left, five years. We would have had just, I mean, we've had 12, we've had 13 years gross incompetence, yeah. but it would have started a lot earlier. And we cannot afford that for that to happen and to continue when we've got all these bright people in this country who should be actually on the queue. I mean, when, when, when Nelson Mandela died, everybody remembered, all the international news remembered that Cyril Ramaphosa boycotted Mandela's inauguration because he was not appointed. Being a baby like that, Yep. You think the baby's going to run the country? I think that's, that's right. why. That's an interesting page out of the history book that nobody really refers to anymore. Well, <laughs> the BBC did. And so did the New York Times and everybody else around the world. You say, hmm. this guy, <laughs> that's the kind of guy you've got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, listen, uh, thank you, Muzi. It's always great to have you on the show. I see lots of comments from people saying, uh, you're so inspiring. Thank you for that. This is this is the kind of stuff we need to hear. And I'm glad that we had a, a different kind of burning platform today, not just talking about specific news stories and you know giving an opinion on them, but having a much better and bigger and more introspective look at ourselves. And thank then, you, Gareth. Me. Thank you. Before you go, this is your opportunity for your ad break. Tell people who you are on the social media so they can see yes, more of you, hear more of you, read more of you, yes. and where to find you. He's not, he's not King Dalindiebo. So just <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, my, I, I think a lot of people, when they try to find me, is they, they spell my Kuzwe with an H. And mine right. is K-U without an H. K-U-Z-W-A-Y-O. Um, and, um, well, I'm on Facebook and on all the social media. And probably not and as, as South Africa's promise.org.za. That's right, at South Africa's And um, because I, I do believe that we will, this generation will and should deliver the South Africa's, South Africa's constitution. Love it. Thank you, Muzi. Thank you so much. And Pums, uh, we will see you next uh, Thursday for some more. Very good. Thank you, everybody. We
We will catch you tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. bright and early. Have a great Thursday. Cheers.